trying to get a, to get the program back on track. And to do that, I am going to introduce our opening keynote um, uh, for today. And he is a man that needs very little introduction um, because he spent 10 years providing absolutely transformational leadership at the African Development Bank. Um, he focused a lot on private sector development, a lot on infrastructure, um, and, and really worked towards thinking through what inclusive growth means and, and how to build um, good ring fences around around fragile states, and that's work that he's continuing to do, actually, in partnership with the University of Oxford and the London School of Economics. Um, he's also been uh, working on natural resource management and making sure that all countries have support institutionally in that regard. Um, and so Donald Kabaruka is really a person who has served the African continent and, and continues to do so. And, and, and as the president of the Africa Society, I, I'm so excited to be introducing him because this is what we do here. We are about building community and building culture and, and building dialogue here amongst the Africans that come from all kinds of countries on the continent. Uh, and, and we like to bring those voices here. And so Donald really represents that vision and that's why we're so excited to have him here. Um, currently, he is serving on an AU reform team that is led by President Paul Kagame. And, and they're really looking at ways of, of making the institution kind of take that next step and, 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 and really serve the African people so that they can own it in a, in a real way. And so I am very, very proud um, to be introducing Donald Kabaruka to you today. And uh, he will give you a speech, but I think most importantly, he's interested in hearing from you um, the questions that you have, especially as young people, um, in how it is that we can take ownership of what Africa's future looks like. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Kabaruka. Good morning. So each time I've heard about uh, someone needing no introduction, I've gone back to a story which Kofi Annan has told me and many others, that he was uh, with his wife in Sweden, having a morning uh, Saturday walk, and then uh, near some little forests. So some kids came nearby, and they all ran to him. Please, can we take, uh, what do you call it, selfie or photo of this? So one of the kids' mom came around. Who is that guy? Oh, Morgan Freeman. <laughs> <laughs> now, Rutendo says I need no introduction, but I can assure you I'm not uh, Anywhere near Morgan Freeman. <laughs> yeah. But I want to thank you, really thank you uh, for inviting me. And some of my colleagues, I can see Brahim Mayak here. I think Fred Swanika was here yesterday. Fred, are you here? Fred, of course. And of course, Grace Machel will be here sometime, I think, uh, today. But I also want to commend you for what you do. <clears throat> uh, like things I've just seen. But above all, for this kind of uh, conversation. Now, you have heard a lot about my background. I was uh, president of the African Development Bank, of course. What Rutendo has not said is whether I did a good job or not. Because <laughs> there's one thing being in a position of power, and there's something else being able to get results from that position. But at the end of it, that is what leadership is about. It's not about being in a position of authority. It's about what you do with the powers you have. So today, I hope to convince you that I did a great job. I can do that confidently because I don't want another job. I'll leave that to you to, uh, to summarize. But frankly, today I would like to focus on three issues based on the notes you sent me the whole concept of Pan-Africanism, and what it means for your generation. And I want to begin this by asking you sometime later today, when you go on YouTube, look at a speech made by the former president of Tanzania, Julius Nyerere, at, uh, at Parliament in Cape Town. It was 1997. 
And I want to paraphrase him. I'm not sure I'll be quoting him exactly, but this is what he said. Each time I meet European leaders, say I meet Tony Blair, he asks me, what is going on in Burundi? I answer to him, but I'm not a Burundian. But Tony Blair would ask you, but you're an African. He said, it does not occur to me to ask Tony Blair, or another African leader, what is going on in Chechnya or in the Balkans. He would answer to me, but I'm British. So he answered by expressing this view that originally it used to irritate me. Why should European leaders ask me about issues of countries which are not mine? And they don't expect me to ask them the same questions. But at the end of it, he said, maybe they are right. And he said, what is Tanzania after all? Tanzania is something we created in my lifetime. Now, he was making a very subtle point that as far as the rest of the world is concerned, you may be here Zimbabweans, Tanzanians, Rwandans, or Malians, the rest of the world sees you as Africans. Because today you have asked to talk about Africa. Can you imagine inviting a European leader from, say, Finland, asking him to talk about Europe, unless it was a European official in Brussels? But I think you are right to ask me to talk about Africa in that perspective. And this is what I'm going to do today. And I want to read from the viewpoint which Rutendo asked me, the work being done to reform the African Union. I think the word reforming the African Union maybe is one requiring a nuance. It is to reposition the African Union for the challenge of today. All organizations in the world require some repositioning. Ask people in Brussels in the EU. Ask the UN. All organizations now require to retool because of the challenges the world faces now. Now, I want to begin by saying to you, especially young Africans here and young Africanists, that the African Union and its predecessor did actually very well. There's a tendency to look at Africa from the viewpoint of, well, the continent has not done a good job. So I want to say to you that there's another nuance. In 1960, when many of the countries were getting independence, many land people, including some here in Oxford, were actually describing Africa as a continent of the hope of the future. The continent of misery, famine, conflict was Asia at the time. Just go back to what was being written in the 60s. Africa was the continent which has all the elements to make it. It was the lack of India, Southeast Asia, and the rest of them, which are being described in the terms which people like to describe Africa today. And I want to put to you that actually, the continent did not do that badly at all. In spite of the civil war in the Congo, civil war in Nigeria, which many of you will not recall, a very uh, sad phase of that country, the economies were almost growing above population. And until 1979, during the time of the second uh, energy crisis, and the issues around sovereign debt, that is when the economies began to go under. And we never recovered fully until the turn of the millennium. But in that earlier period, actually the continent was improving human development indicators, and economic growth was quite reasonable. Now, between 1980 and 2000, so Africa was being described in different terms. Every summit had an initiative on Africa, one following another. But today, it will seem to me that something different is happening. We no longer have the issue of 
north and south. We no longer have east and west. We no longer have a dominant ideology or even a dominant economic model. As someone has said, maybe uh, Professor Decron here might uh, recall, that in 1989, that was the end of the political divide between left and right. But when the Lehman Brothers collapsed, that was also the end of the divide in economics. Today, every country, every region is looking for a new model, what to do. And so at this point in time, what the African Union reform means is, what is it that we should do in this new global order? Global order where there is death of ideology, end of north and south, east and west, rich and poor, by the way. Now I've got pockets of poverty in the north, pockets of wealth in the south, pockets of poverty in the east and in the west. And that's why we have got sustainable development goals. We have the near end of what I would call effective multilateralism. After World War II, there were institutions around the world which helped us cope with multilateral problems from climate, terrorism, migration, epidemics, and so on. Today, those are extremely uh, ineffective. And therefore, we're all looking for different models of handling global issues. Remember that after World War I, World War I, a large part of the globe came together and they created something called the League of Nations to try to bring about a better world. It didn't happen. But 1945, after World War II, a new system came into being. The World Bank, International Monetary Fund, the Global Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, a reformed United Nations. And this worked reasonably, at least from my perspective, until about in the mid-70s, during the first global energy crisis. And then another informal arrangement was born. It was called the G8. In other words, the world's top eight economies. To deal with the energy crisis from their perspective. That worked up to a point, and that point was 2008, when the global economy came to a near-death experience. So a new arrangement was put in place. And that informal arrangement is called the G20, which is basically a club of the rich and the super rich. <laughs> Those who are not rich or super rich are left to wait for the communique. Whether it's global trade, global economics, migration, trade, epidemics, they tell us what they will do. There'll be some initiative on Africa, some initiative on migration, on epidemics, on terrorism, but they are of the view they can resolve the issues of the world. I want to put to you that they cannot do so. We have to come together, all of us, to figure out how to deal with these issues. Now, I perfectly understand <clears throat> that with so many countries in the world, if you come together, there'll be a trade-off between effectiveness and legitimacy. If everybody in the room, that is a legitimate outcome, probably. It may be not very effective, but it is legitimate. If you look the poor people of the world out of the room, you may come out with an effective solution, but you'll have less legitimacy and its staying power is limited. So that applies to migration, it applies to terrorism, to epidemics, to trade, and many other things we have to handle. <clears throat> Let me give the example <coughs> of migration. Because you're going to be hearing many initiatives of how to keep these migrants where they are in the poor countries. No, they should not cross the Mediterranean. Let us look for a way to create employment and jobs so they can stay where they are. Because coming our way is disruptive. 
which it may as well be. Now, my own view <coughs> is that another conversation could be done. Which could be? Which are those parts of the world which have got demographic upside for now in the next 50 years? So, where are those? These are likely to be Southeast Asia, India, the Middle East, and Africa. And where are those parts of the world with a demographic downside? I would say the rest of the world. <laughs> and therefore, rather than saying, can we keep these migrants in their home countries, there could be a conversation of, let us look at how we can get a win-win solution for those with demographic upside and those with demographic downside. Or take trade. <clears throat> So I've gone from the Global Agreement on Tariffs and Trade to WTO, to the Uruguay Round, to attempts at to do a Doha Round. Now I've come to regional agreements. And now we're coming to where one superpower says, it is me first. So we're back to almost, back to the 1930s. So I could go on about all these issues. So what we're trying to do in Africa, what is known as African Union reform, it is actually to try to reposition the continent of how we deal with these issues globally. Because if there were multilateral solutions, we could work together. But there are no multilateral solutions, so we have to figure out how our continent can stand by its own in this new world. Including, of course, how to create a dynamic regional market. Because at the end of the day, uh, as regions like China are transitioning to new economic models, not one based on exports, but based on internal consumption, we can also develop our markets locally. And that takes a number of things which I don't have to describe today. So I want to, to say to you that <clears throat> as you talk about Pan-Africanism, please remember the following or rather ask the following questions. But what does it mean for the average African, for the ordinary African in Bulawayo, in Kumasi, in Alexandria? What does it mean for them? I began by saying, or was it a uh, routine I was telling in the waiting room, that one thing we definitely want to resolve is the fact that while the United Nations Charter begins with a preamble, we the people. The charter of the African Union begins with, we the leaders. And so item number one is to connect the two, we the leaders and we the people, to make it a union of the people. That takes issues around free movement of people, around removing tariffs, non-tariffs, allowing talents to, uh, to grow across the continent, allowing our difference to be managed, our diversity to be managed in a non-confrontational way. That is what is being done. It is about repositioning the continent for the challenges of today. And I'd be happy to answer questions from you. And I know Ibrahim Mayak, who's here, can also help me uh, to answer some of those questions. So I would like to perhaps close by saying one more thing. That uh, in my job as president of the African Development Bank, I traveled around all the countries in Africa, except one where I was not much welcome. Mm -hmm. I will not tell you which one it was. <laughs> but I was not welcome, but I very much wanted to go there. It's amazing to see the talents. It's amazing to see the energy, the innovation of the people you meet. Because far too often, Africa is described in terms which, as if there is something unique about Africa. There's none. If you're looking for risks of doing business, you'll find them in Russia. You'll find them in Latin America, in the Caribbean, everywhere. If you're looking for conflicts, oh boy, ask. People in the Balkans now, Eastern Europe, 
in the Middle East. If you are looking at issues around governance, you find them everywhere. There's nothing specific about the African continent. These are global problems we have to handle together. But every country has to figure out what works for them. And so I'm very proud when I meet people like you, innovators like the ones I've seen here, who are trying to deal with this force of disruption, opportunities, the new technologies, because that is exactly the thing to do. And I'm happy to answer any questions you have this morning. So thank you. Um, okay, so my name is Stefan Durkon. I'm a professor here in uh, the London School of Government and directing a center for studying of African economies. Um, I'll be moderating here, and um, there's plenty of time for questions. I will at some point get a note from Berg saying, now it's really time to stop. But uh, I would like to open the floor for, uh, for some questions. And maybe we can take one or two or three at a time, so yes. Uh, thank you very much for, uh, wait, wait a second for the microphone. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the keynote speech. Uh, we are so happy that you are here and, uh, to join us. Um, my question is, you spoke about enabling free movement across the continent. So uh, this has been a uh, much discussed topic up until recent and some controversial ones as well. So I want to understand how are we going to make that happen in such a way that it doesn't lead to the underlying effect that caused the Brexit in this world in terms of migration of different people across Africa, trying to move from a less, um, less, uh, will I say, even much more less developed countries into uh, the other sustaining ones, so that we don't have this uh, divide that we're currently having in the European world. Thank you. Okay, shall I look at the floor? Yeah, one more question. Microphone is coming. Thank you, Mr. Kabuka, for your speech. Um, my question is, you spoke about pan-Africanism, win-win situations, and we have spoken about breaking the frameworks. Um, people, the global discourse today is about West failure failing, the state system failing, but our history is very unique in that we've had to adapt to many systems, many ways of thinking. So when it comes to the idea of African unity, um, going beyond West failure, going beyond this geographic definition, um, Looking at what African unity means to people in Bulawayo, Kumasi, and Alexandria, but what about those in Kingston, Jamaica, or in Haiti, or in Salvador, Brazil? Is there an African unity, an African identity, a partnership to be made that goes beyond kind of geographical, state-centered, Westphalian like, definitions of African unity? Can we go beyond um, to African communities and people who identify as Africans across the Atlantic? Is there a place for them in a modern vision of African unity that is breaking the frameworks as we seek to do? Maybe we should uh, let you answer. These are big questions. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Stefan. Uh, first of all, I absolutely will not interfere in the debate on migration in Europe. Uh, I'm not an expert in that field. I just want to make, I think, two ex cathedra uh, statements. One of them is that migration is as old as history. Number two, migration has all, almost always been beneficial to the receiving country. Number three, nothing can stop migration. We can interfere with it, but can hardly be stopped in the way I hear nowadays. But I say these are ex-cathedral statements, and you're welcome to, to challenge me. But let me just give you a little story. Uh, please, Prof, forgive me. As, uh, this is an academic institution, so I can be... Uh, Politically incorrect. <laughs> Is there any Australian here? Not this one there. Very good. Please challenge me. <laughs> Australia had something called white Australia policy for a long time. You want to go to Australia, you have to be white. However, that was defined. So by around the 1940s, Australia had a population of about 8 million people. And then as the Japanese were bombing uh, 
and occupying uh, East Asia on the way, Indonesia, Singapore, and all this. They bombed uh, a northern city in Australia called Darwin. Australians call it the equivalent of Pearl Harbor. Luckily for them, Japan did not invade Australia. And then a debate began in Australia as to whether that large continent was defensible with 80 million people. So inside Australia, a debate began on all sides, which was ended around the 1970s, I think, when they concluded they could not simply keep non-white people out of Australia. I want to believe that Australia is a much more prosperous society today than it has been at any time. <coughs> and the proof is it is one of the G20 countries which has continued to grow even in the middle of the global uh, economic crisis. But I want to put that on the table for you. For those who think they can lock out migrants, because for some reasons it is economically damaging. I'm not suggesting that you cannot or you don't have to manage the way it happens. That's a different problem, the one of integration. Maybe a second little example since we're in the UK. In 1972 or three, a chap who was president of Uganda at the time, Idi Amin, a particularly gifted individual, <laughs> decided that Ugandans of Indian origin had to be expelled from the country. A prosperous community, which are contributing a lot to their own country, Uganda. So they were packed uh, uh, like sardines and sent it to the UK. Some British politicians, oh boy, one of them said there'll be rivers of blood, I think. So these are young people, something we should remind them of these issues. So it happened. Slowly, I have reason to believe that that community is one of the most prosperous communities in the UK today. I have reason to believe they are making a huge contribution to the UK economy and employment. But again, that is a second piece of my selective evidence. But for us, Africa, it's, it's a different conversation. Uh, colonial powers came, they divided us into 54 little pieces. No particular logic. Like in the Middle East, we start to speak all times. So at independence, there were two decisions taken by our leaders. Number one, let us leave these borders is there. Because if you open them up, it's a Pandora's box. But they let us try to make them economically irrelevant by coming together. Not politically, but removing tariffs, non-tariffs, and allowing people to move around so that we can take advantage of this huge potential. A lot of progress has been made. Tariffs are no longer a big issue. A lot of non-tariffs are on the way down. The two things which are challenging us now is free movement of business, students, and so on, and then to try to harmonize our policies so they can get our investment policy converging. And that is what the African Development Bank and many other institutions like NEPAD have been trying to do. So that is the logic of our coming together. I'm, I'm going to uh, abuse uh, privileges. Why are you thinking of brilliant questions? Mm -hmm. just, just to follow up on, on, on this for a moment, um, is, is African political economy, the politics, ready for free movement of people within Africa? Well, not only is it ready, it is happening in many regions. Today in uh, West Africa, in the ECOWAS region. You can move freely and stay in a particular country, from Nigeria to the Gambia. It is happening. In East Africa, between Rwanda, Uganda, Kenya, and Tanzania, it is happening. In the SADC region as well. So in particular regions, yes, progress is being made. But now I want to make it pan-African. Mm -hmm. So that people like Niger, like uh, Mayak here, has simply not the right to go to Nigeria and Ghana, but also to Tanzania, to Rwanda, to Zimbabwe, everywhere. We want it to be cross-region. And that's why in the reposition of the African Union, the idea of an African passport is one of the key elements uh, in this uh, conversation. But 
Okay, so I want to ask you a slightly different uh, angle as well. You know, we can be optimistic looking forward, getting more integration in Africa, and um, also people moving, capital moving, business moving. We are, of course, also coming, in the recent history, coming back out of a period of an uh, incredible opportunity with the commodity boom. Um, in your view, has, has Africa or, most, or many African countries wasted that commodity boom period? And what does it mean for what we do next now? Well, I have, uh, I have two answers to that, uh, Prof. One of them is that uh, it's not an irritation, but it is a question. Why is it the same question not asked of Saudi Arabia, of Venezuela, of Russia, of Mongolia? There are many countries today who have to adjust to lower commodity prices. I can see on TV there is a crisis in Venezuela. I have not seen similar crises in Africa. Maybe, which suggests we may have done slightly better than others. So there are a number of African countries, I think about a dozen or so, which have to undergo adjustment to those lower prices. They know what to do on the monetary side, on the fiscal side, even on the structural side, because some of them have done it before. Uh, and that, for me, that's a technical issue of we know what to do. Now we need to figure out the necessary political energy to have it done. But it can be done. That is my answer, number one. Number two, actually a number of countries have been benefiting enormously from lower commodity prices. Mm -hmm. Because many of them are net importers of oil. And so lower oil price means lower pressure on the currencies, more fiscal room, a better balance of payments, and so on. Those two have to try and make better use of these new opportunities. So there is a need for adjustments uh, on both sides. Two of our largest economies at the moment are not uh, doing quite well. They're performing below potential. And when we add them up together, about 15% of uh, all the economies of Sub-Saharan Africa, and we think they can do things differently. And if they do, I think the story you hear now about Africa will be slightly different. Excellent. Yeah, to open up. And, and, and just a comment on that. And I think often here as observers, we focus too much on these two because there's an awful lot of the other countries have actually done very differently and managed much better the whole transition. This is not the 1980s, as some people like to claim. It's not because Nigeria and South Africa are struggling with managing, say, their downturns. It's not the rest of it. And I think there's a lot of positive news to be had from that. Lots of hands. Great. So let's... Um, uh, sorry, can I please say, before you ask a question, just introduce yourself, state your name and your affiliation. Oh, yes. Uh, thank you. My name is uh, Zachary, Zachary Bukeister. I work for Africa Foresight Group in Ghana. And I actually had a question. You mentioned, you kept on mentioning uh, lowering tariffs. And I was curious, sort of, how do you balance lowering tariffs, allowing for free trade, with also um, sort of protectionist policies that allow for local economic value creation uh, with, within countries, so promoting uh, lo local companies and businesses? OK. Let, let's continue with a few on that end. And then behind there as well. Thank you. My name is John. I'm, uh, I'm a student here. Uh, Dr. Kaberuk, I think you, in my opinion, did a very good job at the African Development Bank. But wow. I, cannot do, I cannot say the same of the African Union. My impression is that it's a talking shop. And uh, I, I, I'm very keen to, to know what kind of reforms will be undertaken. My question specifically is, uh, what do you have to say about accountability, particularly by African leaders? As you reform the EU, this is extremely important. As you talk about issues of good governance and so on, there's a certain level of impunity, because if the African Union cannot hold itself to account, and many Africans feel a certain sense of frustration. So I, would, I very much want to know what you have to say about this. Thank you. Okay. So let's take one more. Uh, it will come back to that. Okay, so, sorry. Thank you. Hello, my name is Angel Jones. I'm CEO of Homecoming Revolution. We're the brain gain recruitment firm for Africa. Right. Please, I'd like to understand your comments around the, the age of leaders in Africa. The age of leaders. The age of leaders and how open our very old leaders in Africa are to new youth coming through, 
and which countries are getting it right and how much push there actually is for the, the old leaders to let go. Very good. Okay, so maybe answer them and then we'll take three more. And uh, yeah. yeah. First of all, on tariffs uh, and, uh, and the import substituting industrialization, because what, that's what you're saying. I think many of the high tariffs in Africa were actually not about import substitution. They're about raising revenues for government. And so once we have walked them through how you can actually provide alternative revenues, which can be done by opening up trade to the neighbors, many of them were able to bring down tariffs successfully, including my own country. I happen to have been finance minister at the time, who brought down tariffs from sometimes as high as 50% to 15%, actually and able to increase revenues. And that is story for many other countries. So that was the revenue logic. On import substitution, uh, sitting in front of a distinguished economics professor here, I have to be careful what I say. <laughs> because the theory would be bring down barriers and let the best man uh, compete. I would say up to a point. And therefore, I do think that countries like Zimbabwe uh, have an issue. I think that probably Zimbabwe could have been allowed space to build its industrial capacity. There are a few other countries which I think may be opened up slightly faster than they could have done. And evidence today from countries like Vietnam shows that it is not a black and white, neither or. You could open up some areas faster than others, others a bit slower, you could uh, protect a few for some time until such a point as you think you have an exit strategy for global opening. I think uh, when we were studying economics, it was like it is black or white. My limited experience now tells me there are many shades in between. But I'm sure Professor is better positioned than I to, to answer this question. But if I was to redo it again, depending upon each country's experience, and where they are, I would probably be arguing for selective, partial, dynamic opening of uh, particular sectors. I've looked at the example of Vietnam very closely, and I think that there are many things to learn from there. Now, on the issue of um, age of leaders, are people like me, that is. When I, where was I reading this? Uh, that Jesus Christ died at uh, 33. But he had transformed the world. Did I say oh, that someone said Alexander the Great died at 31 or something? After doing a lot of transformation. Mandela did what is known today as a miracle in the 70s. So for me, I think leadership capabilities has nothing to do with age. Some young people are extremely talented to provide leadership we need. A few of them have done a bit of damage. There's one in West Africa who had to be taken out by force recently. <laughs> now, a few of older leaders also have done a lot of damage. But some have done great. So I think for me it is about how do we identify in a continent as young as Africa, the young people the new generation to take us forward. And listen, people like you, I'm very impressed and very hopeful that actually you have what it takes to take us to the next level. But I think there was another element to that question, is whether uh, our policies are now in shape to look after our uh, senior citizens. Uh, I think that was that part of the question. I'll need to check how different countries are doing, but I think for now our really challenge is to look after the young generation to give them potential to develop their talents so that the famous demographic dividend can be attained. Mm -hmm. Okay, so a few more questions. We start there at the back. And Thank you we'll for the... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. yeah. Just yeah. Yeah. Thank you for the very uh, thought-provoking talk. My name is Victoria Miandazi from Kenya, studying at EFIL in law at Oxford. Um, I'd like to ask about uh, the proposal, the great proposal you made as an AU representative for the uh, Peace uh, Fund, 
um, about uh, 0.2 levy um, on all eligible imports, um, African imports, to help uh, raise, like, uh, foot the largest part of the uh, AU's budget. But then now, um, the U.S. has challenged this the implementation of this proposal um, under the WTO rules. And so I wanted to find out uh, what's the way forward then uh, for the budget of the AU, um, according to um, being, being uh, the person who was behind this proposal. What do you think should be the way forward? Okay, okay, let me answer that because it's okay. very important. Well, let the mic microphone, yeah, we do take these two and we take a few here. Yeah. yeah. And one more there, we continue. Hello. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, my name is Medi Segawa. I'm a founder of a startup, Zen Integrated Services. It's a recruitment agency based in Birmingham, West Midlands, not far from here. Well, my question is about Africa. When you look at Europe, they've got an agenda for Africa. They've got a policy for Africa, how to handle Africa. But if you go to Africa, African Union, they don't have any policy on how to approach Europe or America. Now, I happen to run a startup. One of the challenges I've faced is I've got a bull in the office. He's trying to sabotage me. So if you look at Africa now, so if, uh, I'll give an example of Agenda 2063-2063. It's about the social economic transformation of Africa. And it's a very beautiful piece of, you know, vision. But how do you now fight off the sabotage, maybe from the European Union? Because they're out there to Af in Africa to look for resources. And also, how do you also fight the challenge from America? Thank you. Okay, so bring the microphone to the front here. There were two questions here that we want to do, and then we'll, we'll, we'll wrap up. And I'm afraid we're not going to get everything, and you'll have to do it. Here in the front, there were people were early on asking. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Donat, for that inspiring talk. Uh, I have a double-barred question. Um, my name is Chuksa Pereke, Professor of Environment and Development here at Oxford and Reading. So, uh, but in the spirit of Africa, let me remind you that you haven't answered the question of accountability, yes, yes, which yes, my yes. friend posed. Yes. Okay. <laughs> you charted the history of Africa very brilliantly, and, uh, and you put your finger on when the downturn started in Africa around, around about the uh, 80s. You will recall that that downturn in Africa, although you, 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 you tended to suggest it has to do with oil price, which is rightly so, but a lot of down, that downturn also had to do with the structural sovereign, sovereign debt, the sovereign debt of Africa. Uh, now the sovereign debt of Africa has gone to about 44% of GDP. So simple question, do you think that this debt is sustainable? Do you think that Africa should be moving for another cancellation of debt? Second question, uh, the energy uh, challenge in Africa. Uh, what is Africa doing at the AU level to reposition Africa to be able to deal with the energy and climate change crisis? Can so you take the question here and then I'm afraid... So. Uh, Mike Mason, I'm an Oxford Martin Research Fellow, and I also run an energy company called Tropical Power. But I don't want to talk about energy. I want to challenge your comment about the demographic downside and the demographic upside. All right. Because in a world of perhaps 10 or 11 billion, hopefully middle class people, I suspect that what you think of as the demographic upside, I think of, and many other people think of, as the demographic downside and vice versa. And I suppose my question is, to what extent does Africa, and it's a huge continent, it's bigger than so many other places put together, think about demography as something that is, you know, a positive growth rate is great, and to what extent is it about saying, actually, we have to manage this for our long-term futures? Okay, very good. 
Why don't you take this? Is being praying behind me there to, 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 to get the microphone, and that is the last question, and then we'll close. Uh, thank you so much. I'm Tong from Soas University of London, and since I'm a Chinese, I'm more curious about the uh, economic uh, uh, economic co uh, cooperation mode between China and Sub-Saharan Africa in terms of the combination of FDI and trade and also aid, and also curious about uh, your opinion opinion about the so-called uh, neo-colonialism colonialism that reported by the West and the media. Thank you very much. Right. Okay, so we need to stop now, so that therefore, you know, uh, all these sure. questions, just lots of them and some closing remarks as well, please. Yeah, thank you. But I don't pretend to have all the answers, so uh, <laughs> there might be some, someone here who can provide better insights than I. But let me begin with the funding of the African Union. Uh, no, the proposal for 0.2 levy is still on the table. And I answer to you that uh, the USA has made its position known, but the USA is only one member of WTO. And uh, we cannot take off a proposal on the table because one member. How important there? Because you believe it is technically sound and politically feasible. Technically sound because it is about a clause in the WTO called the Most Favored Nation Clause, which you know very well. But I have two answers for that. The African countries have agreed to become a common free trade area by 2018. When you have a common free trade area and you impose a 0.2 on non-members, that is a completely consonant with the most favored nation clause. That is my technical answer to you. Now, pending that particular phase, there is a way it can be done while respecting WTO regulations. And that conversation is on the way uh, among the African ministers. We are absolutely determined to ensure that the African Union does not continue to be dependent on outsiders to fund our activities. And I want to remind Europeans in this room that this is how the European Union funded its activities for a very long time. That is how EU funded its activities for a long time. But number two, remember, the idea of bringing down tariffs across the world has one philosophical aim, is to permit growth in global trade and remove disruptions. We don't believe, not 0.2%, not 0.2%, not 40% on Mexican imports into some other big economy in the West. It's not 0.2%. We don't believe that is disruptive to global trade. Absolutely not. But we're determined to do this within the international treaties, which we of course respect. But I'm happy to take this up with you later. But the idea is on the table. We believe it is technically sound and politically feasible. Now, <laughs> On the issue of uh, debt, look, Japan has a debt of how much? 130% uh, of GDP, is that right? Yeah, 130% of GDP. But the difference is that it is domestic debt. They borrow from Japanese uh, people. Uh, there are some other countries in this European space, uh, please forgive me not to mention countries, who are up over 40% of GDP. Now, many countries in Africa are still below the 40% cut point. But I want to say to you that whether at 20%, at 40%, at 60%, that number has to be taken in the context of many other variables. That is a very complex issue. So I prefer to look at the entire macroeconomic space, how different variables fit with each other, I want to look at whether the countries have the right debt governance. What do you borrow for? How do you invest? And do you have the right domestic debt management capabilities? So once I've looked at this complete table, we can then decide what is sustainable, what is not. There are now a few countries which are, are reaching alarming levels, red lights, but the majority are either at yellow lights or even at the green levels. That is my assessment. But you're welcome to disagree with me. 
Now, demographic upside, sir, I meant upside in numbers. It's a fact. You can't disagree with it. No, no, no. I don't yeah. agree with numbers. Yeah. <laughs> so the consequences the, of the numbers. Yeah, the upside numbers in the Middle East, in India, the ASEAN region, and Africa, for sure. But where you're right is the numbers themselves don't mean much. We have to manage. We have to invest in those numbers. We have to invest in education, in health. We have to make labor markets which create opportunity for talents. We have to have peaceful societies, and so on. So I do agree with you that the upside numbers is interesting, but what is more important is to invest in those numbers. And I hope that if there's one thing we can do, one thing we can do is to ensure that every child, even from those in the slums, end up in a quality education. That is the one thing for me which is very important. Because right now, with the failure of the educational systems, the private sector take over, which means the children of the wealthy who can afford education. It's the children of the wealthy who can come to Oxford. And the majority of the kids from poor families are left where they are. So the intergenerational transmission of poverty continues, and their demographic dividend is lost. There, I entirely agree with you. What I was saying was different, though was that both sides of the world, those with upside numbers and downside numbers, have to work together for that to happen. Now, there was a last question about governance. Okay. I can assure that your answer is as good as mine. I can assure that if we meet in coffee now, and we argue, we'll probably come to the same conclusion, which is A, governance is fundamental to everything we do. Governance is not the same thing as Scandinavian democracy, but governance is fundamental to everything we do. Thank you. Excellent. So let's thank you for the usual way. Thank you very much.